really encouraging people to come see us now so you can see the cozy version. <laughs> and then we'll see how we can make it cozy when we ha- can shelter more women. So um, anybody can call for a tour anytime. We have a Facebook page for Safe Sleep United. Um, there's a website and my phone number is prominent on the Facebook page. And we're encouraging tours so people can learn more about homelessness, poverty, our shelter in particular, the value of shelters in general. Um, Every shelter is doing amazing work. And DJ Vincent from Church at the Park is also having a big emphasis on humanizing homelessness. So does UGM, their men's shelter and their women's shelter. That's not unique to, to me or us. Everybody is really trying to share the stories, the people, the hearts that are involved in these stories and how it could happen to so many people for reasons we might never imagine. And we're just, you know, there by there by the grace of the universe go I. It could be any of us. The whole idea of talking to you today was based on a conversation I had with you last week. And I told you then I'm speechless. And I was amazed because there was so much I didn't know. And I'm so grateful to you today for coming on and sharing that same kind of information with our audience. Insight really did get some insight today. <laughs> thank, thank you, you Linnell. So for, thank you for being my guest today. We've been talking to Linnell Wilcox. She is the manager of Safe Sleep United in Salem. Thank you for joining us today on Insight. I'm Wendy Brokaw. Good evening. 
Today is Tuesday, January 10th, and the board meeting was called to order at 4.45 p.m. today, with the board going directly into executive session under the following Oregon Revised Statute, ORS 196.6602F, to consider information or records that are exempt by law from public inspection, ORS 192.6602D, to conduct deliberations with persons designated by the governing body to carry on labor negotiations, and ORS 192-6602H to consult with counsel concerning the legal rights and duties of a public body with regard to current litigation or litigation likely to be filed. It is now 6.04 p.m. and we are reconvening our meeting with the public session, which is a business session. I would now like to ask Director Avila to read the land acknowledgement. Thank you, Chair. We are gathered here today on the land of the Kalapuya, who are represented by the Confederate tribes of the Grand Ronde and the Confederate tribes of the Siletz Indians. The relationship between the Kalapuya people and this land continues unbroken to this day. And we offer gratitude for the land and for the generations present and past who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. We respectfully acknowledge and honor past present and future Native American and Indigenous students and staff of Salem-Kaiser Public Schools. We invite you to join us in honoring these ancestral grounds and celebrating the resilience and strengths of all Native American and Indigenous people. Thank you. If everyone would now join me um, to do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That takes us to 3C, agenda modifications. There's one slight modification. Um, right before we go into our spotlights on success, I will be turning it over. Director Avila has asked for a few moments of time on the agenda. Um, I don't believe there are any other agenda modifications from any directors. So with that, I will turn it over to Director Avila. Thank you, Chair, once again. I know my actions of the JV football game between West Ham High School and Sheldon High School in Eugene on October 26th of last year have caused concerns for the officials who refereed the game, as well as some of the members of our community. First, I want to publicly apologize to the referees of that game. I should have never patted the back of the referee. In retrospect, I see this was wrong. No referee should be touched by a spectator like I did. For this, I apologize. Second, referencing the fact that I was a school board member to the referees was the wrong thing to do. I didn't intend to exert control or influence my stating that I was a school board member. Now I see more clearly, by stating that I was a school board member, that gave the impression to the referees that I was using my position to my advantage with the OSAA. I didn't intend that result, but I now understand how improper it was to reference my position as a school board member. The referees of the game in Sheldon on October 26, and all referees, and for all sporting events within the OSAA deserve better. And I pledge to learn from my mistakes. We expect our students to have a consequence for violating their behavior, expectations at school. And as a board member, I also expect consequences for adults attending school district activities. That includes myself. I know that our district must give me an appropriate consequence for my behavior, for which I will accept to help any wounds and uh, mend any relationships that we need to. I thank the board chair for allowing me to make this public apology. Thank you. Thank you, Director Avila. Next, we will go to Spotlight on Success, um, and I will turn it over to Superintendent Perry. Uh, so, 
uh, Director Avila, your mic was totally dead on that. Do you, would you, I want to fully acknowledge your apology. Would you rather do it again so it could be heard? I can say it again. Okay. Uh, Not on CC Media. Okay. Okay. So just not through. Do CC I have a check? Yeah. How about check check mic on this one? Okay. You can there we me? go. We're doing a yeah. quick. Okay. 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 Go ahead, you. Director Avila. Sorry about the technical yeah. issues. Okay. <clears throat> I know my actions at the JV football game at West Salem High School. Um, between West Salem High School and Sheldon High School in Eugene, Oregon, on October 26th of last year have caused concerns for the officials who refereed the game, as well as some members of our community. First, I want to publicly apologize to the referees of the game. I should have never patted the back of one of the referees. In retrospect, I see this as wrong. No referee should be touched by a spectator like I did, and for this I apologize. Second. Referencing the fact that I was a school, school board member to the referees was the wrong thing to do. I didn't intend to exert control or influence by stating that I was a school board member. Now I see more clearly how referencing my position as a school board member gave the impression to the referees that I was using my position to my advantage with the OSAA. I didn't intend the result, but now I understand how improper it was to reference my position as a school board director. The referees of the game in Sheldon on October 26, and all referees for all sporting events for OSAA deserve better. And I pledge to learn from my mistakes in the future. We expect our students to have consequences for violating our behavior expectations at school. As a board member, I also expect consequences for adults attending school district activities, and that includes me. I know that our district must give it an appropriate consequence for my behavior, for which I will accept to help and heal any wounds and re mend relationships. I thank the board chair for allowing me to take, make this apology public. Thank you. Thank you, Director Avila. Next, we have our spotlights on success, and I will turn it over to Superintendent Perry. All right, so we're doing our spotlights a little different. And so we're gonna start with our first spotlight, which is the safety and risk uh, management services department and I think uh, if you could bring your team in and just be you know in the back and you're gonna have to yay there we go look at that <laughs> oh that's kind that's kind of a nice place for a photo back there we'll go back with them in a minute and take a photo all right and presenting the spotlight tonight oh they're still coming in yeah look at them Good team mm -hmm. Um, and I think, well, I know that our chief operations officer will tell the scope of their department. So, okay, and if you're, if you're lingering in the back, you gotta come over a little so we can see you. Can't hide behind the big screen. There we go. Still more. Still more. Yeah, behind the TV. Two lines, two lines. Keep going. Come forward. Come on. Good info. There we go. Okay. Is Chris back there? He is. Is He's Mr. Baldridge back behind the TV? <laughs> yeah, he is. There he is. Yeah. Thanks for coming in tonight, too. It's great to see your faces here. All right. Our chief operations officer right. will give the spotlight tonight. All right. Hello and good evening, Chair Carson Cottingham, Board Director, Student Advisor, and Superintendent Perry. Tonight, I would like to recognize our Safety and Risk Management Services team for their commitment to student, staff, and community safety. Safety and Risk Management Services has many teams dedicated to the safety of our students, staff, and visitors. These teams are represented behind me. We have, uh, well, not all of them are represented, but safety and support response systems, uh, campus safety specialists, which you see directly behind me here, uh, and then our risk management uh, team, uh, which starts with Michael Spence Majors, and goes over to the uh, left there. So uh, across the country, K-12 school communities face an evolving and unique set of threats and security risks, which is why maintaining student and staff safety is a critical function of our district. The Safety and Risk Management Services Department 
here at Salem Kaiser works tirelessly to ensure the safety of all individuals interacting inside and outside of our buildings. An important part of keeping students safe is a strong relationship with outside partner agencies. This includes law enforcement, Oregon Health Authority, DHS, the Juvenile Department, and many, many more. Our Safety and Risk Department pride, excuse me, prides itself on maintaining these critical partnerships in our community. When any concern for a school safety is reported, they move swiftly to investigate and intervene in a manner that best supports the students, our schools, and community. SRMS is not just safety and security, though. The teams within the department are dedicated to serving the community and working to solve sometimes very complex problems to ensure our schools and communities are safe and secure. Through wildfires, ice storms, and a global pandemic, this team behind me worked tirelessly to ensure our staff and students were kept safe, and most importantly, in school. We cannot thank our Safety and Risk Management Services team enough for their continuous work in ensuring both the physical and psychological safety for anyone that steps foot onto our campus. So thank you, everyone. Um, I, yeah, so we're all going to go back there and take a picture, but I do just want to say thank you so much to the whole team. Um, it's really great to get to see you folks like when I go out and visit some of the schools and just see how much care and effort you're putting in for our students and our community. And so thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Should have been like five every time. Oh, really? <laughs> They give kids rides to their cars after school. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. All right. While they're leaving, uh, maybe we could get our next spotlight to come in. And I'll yeah, our next spotlight is Alondra. Oh, there, there you are. Oh, you're like, where do I have to speak from? Okay, you get to speak from Sylvia's spot right there. This is new, a whole new setup and everything. So, all right, oh, our next uh, spotlight is from, um, is spotlighting one of our community partners and Alejandra, a special education teacher at Auburn Elementary is here um, tonight to present this spotlight. So. Alondra, thank you for being here. It's good to see you. Good evening. Good evening, Chairperson Carson Cottenham, board members, and Superintendent Perry. I am happy to join you tonight and recognize a very important community partner. Uh, the Marion Polk Food Share has been a great community partner for years. They stepped up significantly during the pandemic, delivering hundreds of food boxes to schools and families. Um, they continue to work with schools to provide resources to our families, especially those with food insecurities. Many students and families are impacted by food insecurity and do not always have the means to access quality food. Uh, thanks to their kindness and support, 
Families in our district can access food boxes and other resources free of judgment and while maintaining privacy, which is very important for our families. The food share does not share private information with the public about families who receive their services, making it easy and accessible to all who need support. The food share also has a kitchen that can be used by the community and a community garden where they give classes demonstrating how to grow your own food. Students can even volunteer at the warehouse and learn about the power of helping others. This organization is much more than food boxes during our, a pandemic. The Marion Polk Food Share is a necessity in our community. Uh, thank you, Rick, and your team um, for your commitment to this community and dedication to helping those in need. Yeah. Okay, and I think for this photo, we're gonna have you come up here and put your back, and we're all gonna stand in together, but I think uh, our chair has a couple words to say. I just wanna say thank you so much, um, Rick, for being here and to the Marion Polk Food Share. I've had the opportunity to volunteer here and there for the organization. Um, I think once up in Woodburn at a couple different schools, and it's just your staff and your volunteers are incredible and do so much for the community, and it's really um, just so impressive what you're able to do with with all of the um, support that you have here in Marion and Polk counties. And I know it's it's life sustaining and life saving for a lot of people. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, come forward here. Oh, we're coming, are we coming around? Are we coming around? Okay, All right, our next spotlight is uh, one of our, um, yeah, chair would be, yeah, uh, is uh, one of our students from North Salem High School. And uh, Principal Toey is here. Hello, Principal Toey, it's great to see you. Yeah, I think sitting is better for them to present to. We're, this is our first time to be back in person with spotlights for a while, so we're just adjusting on the fly, so. Hello. There you go. Thank you very much for this invitation. It's an absolute honor to be here, especially on spe such a special evening where we're all together. So thank you very much for this. Um, it is an honor to be here, not only to see you all, but also really more importantly to introduce Elizabeth. Uh, her grandmother, Cindy, is here today and her father, Frankie. We're grateful that you both are here. Thank you for joining us. Um, I have some prepared statement just to make sure that I don't miss anything about Elizabeth, because it is worth knowing as much as you can about her. So good evening, uh, Chair Carson Cottingham, Board Directors and Student Advisors, and Superintendent Perry, thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be with you here tonight and introduce you to North Salem High School senior, Elizabeth Valencia. Elizabeth is the recipient of the Stanford Children Beat the Odds Scholarship. The program awards scholarships to students who have overcome significant obstacles on their path to high school graduation. Elizabeth's story was featured at the Stanford Children Beat the Odds Community Luncheon event in November. Ms. Perry, I think you were there. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth has faced many challenges in her personal life. Her story is extraordinary. And though not mine to tell, she has agreed to allow me to reference just some of her history today. Elizabeth was taken into foster care system as a young child, as her mother was unable to meet the needs of her children in a stable and healthy manner. Elizabeth went back and forth between the system for some time before she was eventually permanently placed with her grandmother, who is here with us today. Despite many other obstacles, in addition to the aforementioned, Elizabeth has prevailed. Elizabeth is greatly invested in the health and well-being of others. During her time at North, she has been active in the health services program through the annual blood drive and has completed an internship with Salem Hospital. She is active in AVID and is a candidate for the International Baccalaureate Career Related Program Certificate with North's inaugural class of 2023. 
Elizabeth is expanding her community involvement and positive impact through mentorship in the IB Peer Mentoring Program and has recently applied to be an avid tutor. Her service to the North community as a peer mentor allows her to reach a diverse population of students. She creates positive relationships with other students and helps them achieve academically and socially through her thoughtful mentoring. Elizabeth has a unique ability to make others feel valued and cared for through everyday interactions. And from her experiences, she brings an element of compassion and understanding to our school. Elizabeth stands out as an exemplary student in North's IB program. She takes and excels in her numerous higher level courses while consistently proving to be highly organized, motivated, and thorough in her efforts both within the program and with her outside commitments. Elizabeth is always ahead of deadlines, produces the highest quality work. She demonstrates professional behaviors in her interactions with peers, teachers, school staff, and health industry partners through her health services internships. So again, I wanna thank you for letting me share about Elizabeth with you tonight. She is an amazing addition to North and we are exceptionally glad that she is a Viking. So thank you. I'd love to, I'd love to just Again, say thank you for being here. Um, and Elizabeth, amazing to hear, even if this is just a small glimpse of your story, I wanna say thank you for all that you do. Congratulations for every single accomplishment. You have definitely earned it. Um, you know, you matter, your story matters, and you have already touched the hearts of so many. I'm excited, and I think we're all excited to see how you continue to do that, right, with your story, with your heart. Um, and thanks to, you know, grandma and dad for being here as well, because it takes a village. It takes a village to support students. Um, Thank you, thank you for everything and congratulations. Right, and you get to come on up for a picture. Come on up. And, and grandma and dad and, and principal Toey. I know it. I know. I'm not gonna lie. Let me jump. Okay. Okay. That was fun. We really that wanted was. to liven up our um, spotlight on success, and so thank you for indulging us for a moment. Um, we really appreciate everyone being here and for all the amazing things happening across the district. Um, that takes us to number five, our reports and presentations, starting with Superintendent Perry's report. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, it's good to see all of you again, and uh, really thank you to Chair Carson Cottingham for nudging us and getting us to liven that up. So you nailed it on the first attempt, so thanks <laughs> for um, getting us there. Okay, I have a couple uh, slides uh, tonight, and then I'm gonna turn it over to our Assistant Superintendent, Udos Nata, to um, give you an update on um, secondary um, adoption. So uh, with that, I just wanted to give you kind of a preview of as we're heading into the budget season. Um, it's an important time and we've got lots of moving pieces as we face the 23-24 uh, budget cycle. So first of all, um, we our budget committee selection, we have two open positions. Um, applications opened on January 6th and will close on February 2nd. Um, 
Alice has gotten that out um, to all the necessary parties. And as a reminder, you one of the applicants must be chosen from the District Equity Advisory Committee. We sent the application directly to the committee. We don't know that everyone on there will apply. They may only have one or two, but you have to choose one from the District Equity Committee. The um, You will appoint on February 28th. So on February 28th, you'll have them come in for interviews, you'll have public comment, and you'll appoint um, at that time. Um, so the next thing to remember, though, is this is um, the legislative session, and we're in full session this year. So that's important because the number in the first year of the biennium is the number that guides you for two years of budget planning, hopefully. Uh, typically, the budget um, by the governor's office is um, we get the little preview in December. This year, with the change of um, governors, we won't get our first look at what that state school fund number is going to be or even close to being until February 1st. That's not the final number, but um, it is a first glance at the number. Uh, this year, we budgeted at... Um, 9.3 billion, and I think if you remember in the budget message last year, I said that wasn't a current service level number, but we had uh, reserves so we could carry forward with programs. Um, OASBO, the business officials, um, are is the group that um, will tells us what the current service level is for Oregon schools, and that is um, 10.3 billion is the number we're saying is current service level. And uh, right now, the Legislative Fiscal Office is saying the current service level is around 9.5 billion. So you can see the gap. I know you're looking like, that doesn't make any sense, does it? <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of the landscape that we're navigating as we navigate how to build a budget that's balanced. All right, so next slide. Sometimes it's a little slow to, okay. Yep, there you go. Um, just kind of as a reminder, the state school fund information is going to be late. It's going to be a very uncertain time. We do have declining enrollment like every other district in the state. Ours is mirroring what other districts is mirroring right now. Um, at that $9.5 billion, we won't be able to contain the current service levels. And next year is our last year for the federal emergency funding. And we have about 175 positions in that, so our school district has 175 more just because of that um, ESSER funding. So we're in the process of building scenarios and trying to think about what happens um, when those ESSER funds go away and how do we set the stage for being sure that we have the right dollar amount for students. I say this every time, whoever I am before, the thing that changes lives for kids is people. There's no um, inexpensive way to um, do anything other than people to help kids. You saw from our student tonight a grandmother who helped her and a school who was alongside her full of people that are doing really good things for kids and we want to pay our people well so that they do the best work they can for kids. So just to lay the landscape, you're gonna hear me with budget slides every time as we prep for um, the budget season. All right, um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Udos Nata, who's gonna talk to you about curriculum adoption update at the secondary level. So, Dr. Udos Nata. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Carson, Cunningham, members of the board, Superintendent Perry, and our uh, student advisors. I appreciate you uh, taking the time today to hear out about um, our curriculum adoptions. So we have two secondary curriculum adoptions occurring at this time. They're uh, middle school adoptions um, for language arts and social studies. And so what I'll do is just walk you through um, the scope and sequence of how they work, what the process looks like, and um, what the timeline looks like for that as well. So Assistant Superintendent Cobb, if you can go to the next slide, and thank you for taking on the technology in my absence this evening. So as far as the curriculum uh, adoption process goes, this is kind of um, a flow chart, if you will, that shows the sequence of how the, the process works. It starts with the, uh, the state sharing with us um, the approved curriculums to use. 
and then it goes through a steering committee, and then that goes to a full adoption committee, um, which includes members of the board, parents, et cetera. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. And then they um, curate the materials to determine what materials we piloted at our middle schools. And from there, they also structure our community engagement process. And then um, after that process, we get data about what the, um, of how the curriculum went in um, the different schools, how the teachers felt about it, how um, uh, applicable it was in their classrooms. Then there's a recommendation to the board for approval. And then the schools receive the materials. And I'll talk a little bit more in depth about this process in the following slides. If you can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so uh, this is the sequence of how um, things work in the, in the um, process. Um, beginning in October, we have a steering committee that gets together. Um, and the, what the steering committee does is they, there's a lot of materials. It would take a really long, or a lot of materials, a lot of curriculum available, um, about a dozen or so. It would take a long time for the full steering committee to go through this material. So what happens is they curate this material um, and they ask content teachers uh, for their input about the materials. Um, and from there, they uh, review the materials and um, yeah, the feedback on, on, on the materials from the ODE. And they uh, look at uh, the written materials, the publishers, presenters, uh, and then they test the materials and then it goes through to the actual committee. If you can go to the next slide. And so while we're waiting for that slide to load, yep, here we go. And so here's some more details about what the formal committee does. So we have the steering committee, and I'm going to talk about what the, comp what the composition of the committees are in a different slide, but the steering committee is, consists of teachers uh, from each school represented. So for this, it's like with our teachers from all 11 of our middle schools plus EDGE, um, and uh, social studies teachers as well. Um, after the, the steering committee curates the materials, um, then the formal committee comes together. The formal committee has parents, school board members, etc. cetera. Um, they analyze the data that they get from the, the surveys that they give teachers. Some of the things that they're looking for is what's the teacher's willingness to use the materials? Um, does it just for understanding throughout the textbook materials that they're using? Are the resources in Spanish? Uh, is there an audio component? Uh, is it demonstrate cultural inclusivity? Are there other instructional supports? So when they evaluate these things, um, then they structure what they want the pilots to review when the um, teachers pilot this material in their classroom. Then after the material is piloted, they go through a process where they um, discuss the material and share the material with the community. Um, and then from there, they analyze the data and the input they get from the community. And then they make a formal representation or recommendation to the board. You can go to the next slide. So again, this is the composition of the, the, the body that represents our committee. We have the steering committee, which is the um, teachers uh, and program associates uh, who lead the process. Um, there's again one teacher from each content area. Um, we have two board members serving on this, this process. Uh, director Guzman um, Ortiz and Director Nuno Presi. Um, and then we have parents, and um, we have two parents in this committee um, because we merged the two processes, both language arts and social studies, or the two, uh, uh, the, the two committees. And so for this, we, to be a parent to serve on this, you need to be part of uh, a standing committee to be eligible. And so um, I believe we have parents from the um, Spent Advisory Group and the Native American PAC uh, represented on this one. Can you go to the next slide, please? And so one thing I just mentioned a moment ago is that we have, um, that we're running the language arts and social studies processes together. So it's an integrated committee instead of a separate committee. And one of the reasons that we're doing this is because there's so much overlap and transferable skills um, when it comes to reading, writing, critical thinking in both social studies classes and language arts classes. And also oftentimes the courses are linked or there's um, teaming that goes on in planning. So if you're studying a certain 
content or a certain theme uh, with a social studies class, um, those teachers will work with the language arts class to make sure that the that they're studying complement each other. Um, maybe they're studying civil rights. Maybe they're studying um, uh, feudal era. Whatever it may be, um, they want to make sure that they're they're um, really being linked in their in their um, the way that they're mapping out their curricula. And then also sometimes uh, that uh, has an impact on the schedule as well. And so overall, this approach really does support teacher collaboration, which is something that we promote in all of our schools. Um, can you go to the next slide? So this is just the timeline of how the process works. Um, starting in December 2022, so last month, we had the full adoption committee formed. Um, we curated the choices. Uh, from the, from, and I believe we had about eight or so in the language arts and we're able to narrow it down already a little bit. And so we're in the process right now in January where we narrowed it or where we uh, are um, planning to be able to pilot the materials. I believe there's been a couple of meetings already um, with the uh, formal committee. And then in, in March is when we make our, or March through April, is when we'll make our final selection um, and then we make the recommendation to the board and the curriculum goes through board approval. And then the goal is for next fall when we begin the school year that the uh, middle schools will have a new uh, social studies uh, curriculum and language arts cur curriculum. And that's it, any questions? Director Chandra Geary. Well, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Director Udasinata, uh, Superintendent Ud Udasinata. Uh, this curriculum adoption, it goes through the steering committee and things like that, and then full committee. During this process, is there a transparent process where the rest of the public can see at least uh, uh, some minimal information on how the process works or what kind of materials are being selected so that the rest of the community also can learn and uh, weigh in? because right now the parents who are selected are already from existing committees, but how is the mechanism for getting the general community to also weigh in as the process evolves rather than waiting till the board approves and then only they get a glimpse of it? Yeah, so the, um, in, in uh, our director of curriculum instruction at the secondary level, Gwen uh, Bury Fink is with us, so we can go into a little bit more detail, but here's what I, I can tell you is that we have a procedures process um, that's part of our QAM, and so we follow that process. And the component where we have the community engagement is after the formal committee, which includes um, two parents, um, has already uh, occurred, and then they can review the materials. Uh, we select our uh, curriculum from the, um, the state approved list from ODE, and I believe that's accessible just online. And so parents can, re can review those. And then on the list, uh, there we select from those that are deemed exemplary or those that meet the, the state standards. And so that's the process that we use to curate um, the, the variety of curricula that we have before narrowing it down to what works best for our parents. And so those things are, are curricula that you can find on the ODE website. Um, but as far as the procedures go, our procedure is to really bring parents in at the um, formal adoption committee part component, and then the uh, when we open it to the public. Uh, Director Brewery Fink, do you have anything to add? I don't. I would just add that um, we will be bringing continual updates to this forum so that parents can learn about where we are in the process. And once we do narrow to pilot materials, um, we'll be sure to bring that to the board space so that parents and the public can get an update as we go along the process yeah. here as well. So can I, um, I'm not sure if that answered your question, so let me ask it a little different way. Uh, with the health adoption, we had, um, when we got to the place we were piloting, we got materials in the school, we gave parents a chance to view. Um, we also had, um, some public viewing places, and I'm assuming we'll do this with this adoption as well, where we have places in the public that will advertise it. I don't know if you remember the advertisement that went out around uh, elementary health adoption, where we said, here's all the places you can go look at the material. So there's a way for, ha to, for there to be public viewing. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> it, 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 I mean, this uh, ODE as a list of exemplary or very good uh, curriculum, is that an easy place where it is available so that parents can know where is what, or could there be a web uh, page created in our district so that on a real time parents can know this is where the pool we selected from, this is the stage we are in, so that parents don't have to feel lost uh, yeah. at what stage it is or what is the material that is being selected. So there's a lot of misinformation uh, or misunderstanding. So that I'm hoping that this, right from the beginning, if every stage is clearly available, mm -hmm. so then they can fill in the blanks rather than worrying about what's going on. Yeah. Did you, um, did you hear, it wasn't quite a question, but maybe a little feedback for being sure that we have a way to be really transparent about um, the materials, the adoption, where we are in the process um, versus sending to like ODE website? Yes, I heard that feedback and I think we can definitely implement that on our district website, just um, especially once we have it narrowed to specific materials because um, um, I think it might be overwhelming just the sheer quantity of materials that we have um, right now on our list, but especially once we narrow, just making sure to update um, parents as we go through the process. I think that's great feedback. Thank you. Uh, yes, can I give a little input on that also? At ODE, they also have committees that they, from across the state, that they bring in representatives to review the material. And so it's very well uh, validated about the material that they present to the, to the districts as, for what they want for their adoptions. Mm -hmm. Second vice chair. Yeah, I mean, I was at the last meeting in, was this December? Gosh, it seems like so long ago. Um, and I know that there's an upcoming meeting later this month and happy to answer um, or walk through with any one um, of the directors about what that process looked like and just an overview of some of those materials, which we had the opportunity to. Um, you know, break out in groups, discuss, and go through different criteria, uh, just as uh, Assistant Superintendent you know, Udolsanita just went through um, on the different criteria of those. So I know that there are several, and it is a thorough list, um, and happy to just have a conversation with anyone about what that process looked like, and even following the next meeting. And it's really early, so this is the first, here, here's what we're doing. Um, to start the process and why we're bringing it to you, just like we did with elementary health, where you got updates. You'll, you'll see an update about this probably every month now. And my hope is to leave it in a web page that people can go back and say where we are at every stage. Even the stage we have completed, we can leave it there so they can go back and read. Because this is one of the commonest questions that we feel, I feel as a director. What is going on? What is being taught? We should take the mystery out of it so that there is no misunderstanding. That's my two cents. Any additional questions, comments? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we'll go to a quick update on our superintendent search. Um, we have a few slides here up on the screen. Um, in working with our consultant, Human Capital Enterprises, um, this week, um, Hank also gave me um, some bullets to share with you all. So the window for recruitment closed on January 2nd. Um, HCE is telling us that they are delighted by the caliber of the candidates who submitted applications, and they come from near and far. Um, Hank. Kathleen and Jay were all engaged in the initial determination of candidates who merit a preliminary interview based on alignment between the application and the district's ideal profile, which we all worked to create. Um, a healthy number of candidates were invited forward for preliminary interviews, which the team completed on Sunday, and they're now conducting individual telephone reference calls on those applicants. Seals are also being redacted to eliminate candidate names, pronouns, and other potentially, potentially protected class information, um, as was requested by our board in preparation for January 22nd, I mean 21st, which will be our all-day in-person meeting coming up really soon here. Um, the board will review all applications, not just those who were invited for preliminary interviews. 
um, at our executive session, which will be held that full day in person meeting Saturday, January 21st. And then Hank will recommend at that time that we select between five and seven candidates for first round interviews. Um, he is reporting that he thinks our job will not be easy due to the very high quality of talent um, within the pool. As one interviewee said, is this district for real? In a wonderfully positive way, um, before discussing how excited or how exciting the commitment to equity is in Salem-Kaiser Public Schools and how the district's values are fully in alignment with the candidates. So I'm excited to get to work and roll our sleeves up on the 21st. All right, uh, before we move on to the next agenda item, you can pull the slides down. I have one other little surprise video for you. Um, so I think uh, Emily or Jordan's on the line there. I'm just gonna show you a little surprise video. Ooh. No, it's not TikTok, it's not TikTok. <laughs> no. Nope, not TikTok. I know, <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> Good evening. Today is January 10th, 2023, and a board meeting of Salem Kaiser Kids is now called to order. Let's take attendance. If you are here, say here. Here. If you are not here, say not here. Good. We have two topics to cover today. First, let's talk about lunch. I propose that we have pizza every day for lunch. <laughs> Any comments? If we have pizza every day, then it won't be special anymore. Trust me, I have raw broccoli once a year, and it's not special. <laughs> Good point. I second the motion to have pizza for lunch every day. All in favor, say aye. 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 Good. The next order of business is to pass resolution about January being school board recognition month. The school board does a lot of work to make our schools better. They should be recognized. I agree. Last fall, even though there was so much going on, the school board established a set of goals to make sure they stayed focused on the work that improves learning for students like us. They do work really hard. They often stay up past my mom's bedtime whenever they meet. <laughs> All in favor say aye. Aye. With none opposed, the resolution has been passed. January is officially school board recognition month. Thank you, Salem Kaiser School Board. Meeting adjourned. sure you have a link to it in your email uh, so that you have it <laughs> thank you for the work that you do and we thought it appropriate that um, kids shared that with you so um, thank you to our students at I think it was at Kalapuya who um, did that video for you that anyway and thank you for the work you do it's not easy um, it's often a lot of hours and I just thank you for doing it in the way you do it thank you Pass my, my bedtime. Pass yeah. mom's bedtime. Pass all we of understand. Our bedtime. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much okay. to all the students that participated. I'd love to know where their names. We could reach out to them. Yeah. They had names linked. They did. Yep. We'll get you yeah. the oh, full. We'll have to rewind the yeah, we'll get you the full lineup with the video. <laughs> that um, was amazing. Our comms. So thank you to our comms department. Yes, They'll get that for you. you. <laughs> thank you, Sylvia. <laughs> okay. Um, that takes us to public comment. Um, oh yes, there's been a request for a break, so let's take five minutes. We'll start public comment just a little before seven.
Nomás queríamos avisar a nuestras familias que el enlace en español, lo, por alguna razón u otra lo perdimos, pero tenemos un nuevo enlace para que puedan oír a la reunión. Está en el sitio web del distrito y también lo estamos mandando a los contactos que tenemos. Entonces, si se pueden dirigir al sitio web del distrito para encontrar el nuevo enlace para escuchar la, la reunión en español. Gracias. Um, so I just wanted to let everyone know that we lost um, our Spanish interpretation. Um, like the, the link itself went down and so we've got a new link up and it's on the district website. And we're also sending out the link to some of our contacts. But if any of our folks need to hear the meeting in Spanish, um, they can go to the district website. Thank you. Thank you, First Vice Chair. Okay, that takes us to public comment number six on our agenda. Um, we have selected speakers at random. We have public comment by Colin and Zoom, and we have allotted 30 minutes to hear comment this evening. Each caller has three minutes. Electronic mechanisms are used for translation. We have a countdown timer on screen for monitoring time. The timer counts down from three minutes at 30 seconds, it turns from green to yellow. At one second, it turns red and plays a short bell to signal that time is up. Please be mindful of your pace for our interpreters. As a reminder, all board members receive the written comment, which is also posted to the website. Tonight, six people have signed up to comment, so we expect that we can hear from everyone who signed up within the allotted 30 minutes. Um, and then just as a reminder, all of us board members have devices up here so that we can switch channels if someone is speaking um, in Spanish and you want to hear it interpreted to use these devices and um, our amazing communications staff will also alert us so that we have a moment to get tuned into the channel so we can make sure not to miss what people are saying. Um, also, if you are joining as a board member on Zoom and someone begins to provide public comment in Spanish and you wanna hear it in English, you need to click down at the bottom of your Zoom screen that you would like to hear the meeting in English. So just quick reminders um, for accessibility. Also, we received um, feedback about our public comment process and the time allotted. And we just wanna make the public aware that if there were many, many people wanting to comment, um, we are flexible enough to expand the time frame on our agenda, but the last several meetings, um, there have been fewer people signing up and so we've changed it to 30 minutes. Um, we can adjust as needed when there's additional people that show up, you know, within reason. So with that, I would love to hear from our first person for the night. Our first caller tonight is Cassidy. Great. Hello, board director. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Hello, board director and superintendent. Thank you for the opportunity to give comments. My name is Cassidy Trout. I'm a mom here in the Salem Kaiser School District. I would like to urge all of you guys to begin putting academics back to the forefront of our district. I understand that education looks different for each child. Not all children are math wizards. Not all children are meant to be novelists. And not all children are college bound. Our district does such an amazing job with our CTE and CTEC program. They prepare students for success right out of the gate. We need to be expanding these programs for students who choose that, this route or may not excel in the classical school setting. I'm a huge supporter of these programs and my son spends most of his day in the McKay CTE buildings. This does not mean that we can lower our academic standards. This doesn't mean that we should demolish TAG, the TAG program. This doesn't mean that we should eliminate honors classes. Providing opportunities to one group of children should not come at the expense of another. We can do many things for many different children, and we are 
but please don't let our brightest stars burn out in the name of equity. Instead, let's create so many shining stars in this district that you can keep the Salem Kaiser School District from space. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Our next caller tonight will be joining by Zoom. Um, Marilyn is our next caller. Great. Marilyn, can you hear us? Marilyn, are you there? Okay, I think I'm ready. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much. Good evening, Chairperson Carson Cottingham, Vice Chairs, Directors, and Superintendent Perry. My name is Marilyn Ellis, and I serve as the SKEA Vice President. My comments this evening will address school safety. I've addressed this group each of the previous three months on the same topic. We are very concerned about injuries to staff, especially those caused by our students. We are worried about the effect this has on the learning environment for the students witnessing these events, and we are worried about the long-term impact of exposure to and fear of violence. Approximately two months ago, we received a draft from district leaders for a protocol of response to this type of incident. We offered some feedback and have been waiting ever since to see a plan put in place or an opportunity to continue the conversation. The ball has been dropped at the expense of student and staff well-being. This is unacceptable. Before we worry about test scores, before we examine graduation rates, before we look at anything related to the education of students in Salem-Kaiser, we must first address safety. A student who feels unsafe cannot effectively learn, and a teacher who feels unsafe cannot effectively teach. It seems like a given that we should do our best to create safe learning environments and respond quickly to injuries. Common sense dictates this. In no other type of workplace would an employee be hit, kicked, or bit, and then be expected to simply continue working with the same individual who has just caused the harm. In no other type of workplace would a person be ex expected to continue working without taking the time to assess the degree of injury. In no other type of workplace would we tell people getting hurt is just part of the job. But this is exactly what we do in Salem-Kaiser. We have been waiting for the district to provide a response to our proposal or submit an alternative proposal now more than six weeks. Our community and our leaders should be outraged by this delay. Our educators certainly are. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Our next caller is Angela. Go ahead, Angela. Angela, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, my name is Angela Plowhead, and I'm calling to address the same issue that was just addressed, which is the safety of our schools. Um, as a parent, I've been extremely distressed that the safety of our children has not been uh, taken more seriously as well as for the teachers, like you just heard. I've watched over and over throughout many months and actually over the last two years where parents have brought concerns, where community members have brought concerns about the safety of our students and our teachers and how that impacts the educational environment and our students' abilities to engage with learning. I feel like this has fallen on days and that no serious consideration has been taken by this board that when we have asked repeatedly to have SROs brought back into the schools and plans and policies put in place that will prevent incidents of violence from occurring in schools that it has not been addressed. When we have had a community member that was followed to their vehicle from a school board, um, meaning <coughs> that what occurred was blame of the community member instead of addressing the issue that 
there was violence being perpetrated and that those same community members that followed them out were actually harassing that still has never been addressed and when teachers and administrators wrote into this board and to this um, district to talk about how difficult it was for them in that environment after their principal had been knocked out by students and hospitalized that that was not seriously considered when recently actually it wasn't recent it was back in november one of the school board members uh, director avila what is was witnessed assaulting a referee that that has not been addressed we've been told that there was an investigation that was going to happen I have serious questions as to why this board has not taken further action against him and why he has not resigned mm -hmm. at this point. As public figures, you were supposed to, to be setting an example in our school district. That has not happened. I feel like it is directly in violation of the policies that you're going to be talking about this evening in relation to school board uh, director's conduct. So I would ask respectfully that Director Avila resign and that this school board take corrective action. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Our next speaker tonight is Jeff. Jeff, go ahead when you're ready. Chair Cottingham, uh, Superintendent Perry, and school board members. Uh, I initially planned to give a lengthy statement about problems that we faced after talking to countless people about the issues, some of them in this room, um, but we all know what the problems are. So instead, I wanna say that it's about time for you to stand together with the employees of the Salem Kaiser School District for some solutions. Uh, it's about time for increased staffing levels to improve staff to student ratios. It's about time for Implementing better onboarding practices for new employees and meaningful professional development that is informed by veteran educators on the ground. They know this work and the challenges better than anyone. It's about time for specified training for classified employees working with individual students with IEPs. Um, and most importantly, it's about time for more venues and programs for extreme behavior situations, especially at the secondary level. Because we are using the majority of our resources in a building, when we are using a majority of our resources in a building to address repeated extreme behaviors with one student, the education, uh, the other students are not getting the education that they, that they deserve, and that student is not getting the education that they deserve. So we need programs that will help with that. Um, our charge, as you know, is to provide an education to every student. Working together on solutions from the ground up is the only way we can make that happen. And we are a willing participant in this process. We want to partner with the district to come up with solutions to the behavior and safety issues that our colleagues are seeing on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Our next speaker is Edie. Go ahead, Edie. Good evening, board chair Carson Cunningham school board leaders and Superintendent Perry. Uh, my name is Edie Buchanan and I'm the president of Ask ASP, our classified union. I believe by now you are aware of the staff injury crisis throughout our Salem-Kaiser schools. The high rate of staff injuries is happening due to students with extreme behavior and trauma. It was an issue before the pandemic, but now the crisis is full blown and it appears to have no end in sight. It is a threat to our entire education system. The result of this crisis is not just staff injuries causing physical and mental trauma, but staffing shortages as well. Also, a result of this crisis is staff being thrown into an unforgiving workers' compensation system that clearly is a structure that does not benefit those injured. And to make matters worse, new employees and often current employees are not given tr sufficient training to navigate this crisis. My goal this evening is not to point fingers, but to offer solutions with your involvement. 
I believe the best start toward a permanent solution is to hold listening sessions with the chair and vice chair of the school board, district leadership, and members who have been impacted by this crisis. Ask ESP leadership is aware of the complexity of the issue and the legalities involved. However, we have also known through conversations with injured members throughout the last couple of years that current systems in place at the district are broken. We believe an audit of those systems is in order to determine a path forward to reduce injuries and to help all students and staff succeed. I cannot express enough the sense of urgency around this crisis. Work should not hurt. Being injured is not part of our members' jobs. We all want students, we all want to help students in crisis, but to do so, we must listen to those amid the crisis. Our members have expressed often that they are not being heard, their idea, ideas and solutions ignored. Who better to offer solutions but those who do the work and have the most relevant experience to work with the board and district leadership? Our voice matters, our students matter. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Our final speaker tonight is Tyler. Good evening, board chairs, directors, superintendent, and student advisors. I am Tyler Skilla Lakeford, the president of the Salem Kaiser Education Association, speaking on behalf of members. Last month, I shared with you about the subtractive mindset article. This article explains that in times when educators are struggling to carry their heavy load, this is the time to take away less important tasks and focus on what is more, most important, teaching our students. Many district leaders said they read through and want to discuss this more. However, this discussion is yet to take place. Also, I just learned today that an earlier concession to provide two hours of educator-directed time a month for our middle school educators is now being reduced to one hour. This comes at a time which many middle school educators are losing their planning time to substitute for others. If before and after school time, and planning time is taken up with more meetings and tasks, when are they actually able to do their job? In addition, this district is always looking for more time for more meetings, meetings and trainings. They're asking educators to stay through the evenings, even offering weekend options. To quote a classroom reformist, Dr. Brad Johnson, it's not if it's not important enough to fit in the school hours, then it's not important. And if it is, then something less important needs to be removed first. We have to value teachers' time and add no more to their plates. Yet this is what continues to happen, adding more to people's plates. In talking with a colleague yesterday, she relayed that she loves teacher, teaching. However, dealing with behaviors and leaders who do not value her as a professional, she wonders if her skill set is better off, better off elsewhere. And she would probably even earn more money. Yet she loves teaching and she remains hopeful that some changes will happen. This is a story I hear constantly. Many are still questioning, is this worth it? Each month I have said, we have the opportunity to rewrite the narrative for Salem Kaiser Schools and yet little change is happening. Each month we are hiring more educators. While we appreciate these individuals stepping into our schools, many come to us without any training some without even completing a bachelor's degree. And yet, on the other end, it is our many of our experienced, experience, knowledgeable educators, our veterans who are losing hope and contemplating leaving Salem-Kaiser and possibly education altogether. If we do not make the needed changes, we will lose more. We seem to be stuck in Einstein's definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and over, expecting different results. Let's engage in a real conversations that bring about real change. Something must change for our schools to thrive. Thank you. Okay, I think that was the last caller for this evening. Um, is everyone up for moving on to our next agenda item? Does anyone need a break? We do have one scheduled on the agenda, but we took one earlier. We good? Okay. Little, little break? Five, I need break. 
Okay. Great, we will do that. We will take a five minute break. It is 7.21, so we will come back at 7.26. Thank you.
and which is our action items. And um, the thing that we want to take action on tonight is to approve the revisions to um, our board governance policies 1, 3, 4, 7, 9, 11, and 12. Um, we can do a quick review of this item. Were you going to do that? Or is that me? Either one. Yeah. Okay. You start and then I'll, I can. Okay. In. So just as a recap, we. We talked about this last meeting um, when we first brought these back, but um, this was the culmination of the work that we did with the Oregon School Boards Association's employee, Vince Adams, um, in working with our whole new board and updating um, our agreements with one another and sort of how we want to operate. And we wanted to memorialize that through these board governance policies. And so board leadership took a stab at incorporating a bunch of the agreements that we had come up with putting them into the various policies where it seemed like they might fit. Um, additional feedback came in um, over this process, and we also did receive more feedback just this week from Director Sean Jagiri that we worked to incorporate into BG7, which was why the agenda got reposted with his feedback included at that time. Um, I'll turn it over to Superintendent Perry if there's anything else you would like to highlight or point out. Yeah, um, the one thing I would like to highlight is um, Isaac and Ray Lynn, our student advisors, offered some suggestion in the uh, selection of student advisors. So that language is in um, this as well. And I think given the comments that I took notes on last time, we were able to incorporate everyone's um, comments um, and feedback throughout. Great, so with that, I would love to take a motion um, on moving our revisions forward to the board governance policies. I move to approve the revisions to board governance policies 1, 3, 4, 7, 9, 11, and 12. Great, is there a second? I will second that. Thank you, Director Avila. Um, and now I will ask for discussion. Director Shantagiri. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I really appreciate uh, <coughs> considering the little suggestion that I sent to you and really appreciate incorporating the ability for the individual board directors to speak while respecting the, that they cannot speak for the board. It is very important. So I have a clarifying question. Either chair, you could, or you could direct our legal counsel to kind of say, the ability to speak to the press is the question, is that protected by our Constitution or not? And this is also critically important because this is also part of the free speech and getting to the constituents because you can't talk to 200, 300,000 people, so we'll need to retain that. And those who are, if they decide to campaign the community, the press can ask questions. So will that thwart their ability to speak to the press, or do we have to? It is subsumed under the constitutional right. If somebody can explain it, that will be really helpful. Can I ask a follow-up back? Please. It, can you see anywhere in that BG7 where it might exclude that right? Is there an explicit statement that says you as an individual board member may not speak to the press? It doesn't say that, but it has omitted the words like the one I suggested, individual board directors to, what is that word I said? Uh, individual board director to communicate with their constituents. Uh, individual board director retains the right to speak and communicate in their individual capacity of board director to their constituents, press, and public. The reason I mentioned press is because if press ask questions during campaigning, etc. Will this prevent? That's the reason I don't want somebody misunderstanding. Is okay. talking to press protected by constitution is not, I'm not aware of it, I'm not knowledgeable, so if somebody can clarify. I mean, I would just, Rebecca can jump in a second here. I would say that, yes, that anybody is free to speak with the press, and we as elected officials can speak with our rights intact. I think the agreement we made when we were working with OSBA was around having the chair or the chair designating someone to speak about decisions before the board or um, 
board business on behalf of the board. So I think there's a little bit of a nuance and probably like a case by case decision for each director to make. I don't think anyone is, at least I'm certainly not saying we wanna police everyone's contact with the press and we are all elected officials, but that we would try to work in a manner that's collegial and allow board leadership, the chair, et cetera, to speak on behalf of the board to the press in that capacity. But Rebecca, if you want to add anything or. Uh, in, just in general, in terms of whether or not that would violate the First Amendment, it wouldn't, systems can put in place certain, well, what happened here in terms of certain boundaries when you are speaking as a board. And so that's what I understand this to be. Thank you. You know, I, I, I yeah, I think that, uh, I feel protected. I would not want to go out and say something that would violate uh, evidence or some other type of investigation that's proceeding at that time. And I would, I think by having that understanding before that individual, whoever was designated to do be speaking for the board would be more of a comfort level for me. Thank you. Director Avila. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I would just like to point out that this is the same policy that we had, language that we had even last year as I was serving as a board, and it was the same language that you had when you were serving as a, as a board. So just speaking on behalf and being respectful of what the board decision Correct. is, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. And that's, Dr if you Wait, can. I think Director Hyen has had her hand up. I, Oops, sorry. It's hard for me to see you, Marty, like because you're little very little. tiny on the Zoom board, but I just noticed a little yellow hand up there. So go I'm ahead. Sorry. I there jumped you are. up and down, but you know my knee probably wouldn't like that too well. <laughs> um, I, I like the verbiage that was added, but but here is my issue. Government is not allowed to censor speech. Period. And I will, and we use the word owning. I will not own anything past that I find egregious or immoral. If I vote no, there's a reason, and I will not own the decision of others. I know I can't change the result of a board vote, but I'm not gonna own it. And then also on DG11, uh, there's some good words in here, but we don't enforce it. Uh, speaking specifically to exhibit A at the bottom, fighting, threatening behavior, harassment, that's happened. And a person who's been harassed still has not received proper remedy. Uh, abuse, hate speech, we get this frequently. Um, we're not enforcing it. So I'm not sure why we're bothering with those words. So for those reasons, the way these are currently written, I will not be voting in favor. Thank you. <clears throat> Director Shandakiri. I just want to clarify that uh, it is really important for individual board members when they are talking or answering questions from the press or community not to represent the board, not to speak on behalf of the board. That's absolutely mm -hmm. important. And board chair or the leadership should be the one to say these are the things mm -hmm. that happened. But on the other hand, the press or the public will ask questions and they should have all the right to ask any questions so as an individual or individual board member, you can, I would like to have the ability to say, as an individual person or individual board member, here is what I think or what I feel or this is what happened. Which, uh, because there is going to be a lot of questions that will come up uh, and public has a right to know. The second reason is it's also important to speak up when we see there is something that is not right, even if you're one person, because that's how we bring about changes and bring you know, social justice, somebody will have to speak up. And you know, as we enter the campaign season, there'll be lots of questions that will come up. Mm -hmm. So we cannot limit the board directors from not able to discuss with the press or answer the press, whereas that will give an undue unfavorable position for the board directors, sitting board directors, compared to say another candidate who may be free enough to speak uh, as they feel or as they think 
things have happened. So there has to be some freedom. But if it is subsumed under free speech, that's pretty much, and the other rights, that constitutional rights, that should hopefully cover it. But thank you for having this discussion, because at least from the public mind, I wanted to make sure that speaking to the press is also a part of our constitutional right. That's all I just want clarification. Thank you. If, if I'm wrong, please correct me if I'm wrong. Either a legal counsel or the chair can say. I don't think that you're wrong. I think that the policies as written embody what you're saying, especially with your feedback included. Thank you. So if you're comfortable. Yes, and I okay. should retain all the tools that is available under the, our constitution to yeah, write to absolutely. the press, speak to the press. So that's really important to protect it for all seven of us. Great, yep. Um, other comment? Okay, um, if there's no further comment, then I will call for a vote. Um, all those in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Okay, um, and any nays? Nay. Thank you. Okay, we have adopted the new board governance policies. One, three, four, seven, nine, 11, and 12. Thank you so much for everyone's work on those and feedback and um, prior or former immediate past chair Avila for bringing in um, Vince to work with us on those and the superintendent and her team for helping us incorporate them and our current board leadership, our awesome vice chairs for working through the process. Um, okay, consent calendar is next. Um, Superintendent Perry, would you like to review any of the items on the consent calendar? Uh, no items to review, just standard reports. Okay. Um, does any board member wish to pull an item from the consent calendar? Okay. Seeing none, um, I will take a motion. I'll motion that we approve in the consent calendar as okay. is. Thank you. A second? I'll second. Thank you. Um, and let's vote. All those in favor? Aye. Raise your hand. Aye. 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 Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Passes unanimously. That takes us to number nine, which is the first reading for the Iris Valley Charter School proposal. I'm going to ask Superintendent Perry to review this item. So um, in your board packet uh, tonight is the first reading of the Iris Valley Charter School proposal. Um, the way this will work is you're seeing it as a first reading tonight. Um, at our meeting in January, we will present um, additional information on the proposal, um, give you um, the ins and outs of what we see in the proposal. The proposal is complete, but we've not um, provided you any information on the substantiation of the items in the proposal tonight in public. Um, but it is your responsibility to dig through the proposal and as you have questions in the next maybe seven days or so, if you could shoot me questions you have, and then when we present to you on the 24th, um, we will give you answers to those questions that you have along the way. So please just stick those in writing to Alice or I, we'll collect them and then structure our presentation around that. On the night of uh, the 24th, you'll have um, not only the presentation, but you'll also have a hearing and then the hearing is the time to hear our recommendation and then for um, Iris Valley Charter School to provide comment and um, bring in any supporters they want to provide comment. So we'll set a period of time for the public hearing. We'll close the public hearing and then you'll take action to approve or disapprove the um, charter school application at that time. Um, I'm going to look at uh, Rebecca or uh, Director West to see if you have anything you want to add to this. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Perry. Um, that will take us to number 10, information and standard reports. Um, back to you, Superintendent Perry. All right, um, just a um, one item related to the standard reports. On the SIA, the student investment account, there is a requirement within the law that you have an audit 
Um, it wouldn't have had to be there because we have a requirement for an audit anyway. So when our uh, accounting firm comes in to do the audit, part of that audit is the student investment account funds. So the audit is complete, you've received a copy, it was a clean audit, no material weaknesses, anything, any problems within the audit. It is linked on our website, it was linked in the, um, the uh, board plate for tonight, um, but just so you know, that was um, uh, completed. Um, and other than that, I don't have any other comments other than to, um, you may wanna look ahead to the calendar because you got a lot of things coming up on your calendar. So um, hang on, because <laughs> here you go for a very busy um, couple of months. We'll try to make it as fun as possible. How about that? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, and that takes us to board reports. Um, let's see. I will just take volunteers tonight. Who has a board report? Isaac. Yeah, um, just a couple things, starting with last week's District Equity Advisory Group. I think that's the official title. But we had a great meeting with Gwyneth Brewery Fink, Monique Aguilar, and Michael Cent. He's one of the- Cemental. Cemental. And um, we learned a lot about what our district is doing um, in terms of bilingual systems and um, English learning and assigning credits for um, knowledge, not seat time. And I came out of the meeting fearing, feeling very hopeful and excited about some of the things that are rolling out. Um, and we got a lot of good input from students and it was a great discussion. And I wish it would have been longer, but um, it, was, it was still, um, really, I've just left feeling really good about things that were going on. Um, and then just a shout out to the two West Salem security guards who, or safety officers who I did not see today. Um, but shout out to Rodney and Senia for their hard work. And then I had the privilege to go down to Straub today and um, meet with some of the behavior specialists and um, life skills people. So shout out to Mr. Beckett and Carissa and um, Mr. Lindsay or Dalton. And they have a room there that's like the calm room or the vibes room. And it's a space for students to come in and collect themselves and have a conversation with a trusted adult. And there's like LEDs on the sides and there's puzzles and it's just such a cool, relaxing space. There's a little treadmill, and it's just an awesome space, and I'm like, I'm just really excited and inspired by a lot of the things that I see as a student and all these different levels, um, and so kind of some gratitude, um, and then also just wanted to share that with the community. Thank you, that was a great board report. Uh, Isaac, can I, ask you a, can I ask you a couple questions? Yes. Uh, the presentations earlier by the uh, teachers, do you see the behavior that, 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 they're, that they were referring to, and is it as, as severe as they explained it? Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm, I listened to that, and I have yet to experience and, or see an instance like that, and I definitely don't wanna negate um, their experiences all, and so that's something I'm really curious about, um, because I mean, we all value our teachers a lot, and at, at my high school, in my experience, or I spend time in the elementary school, um, and I spend a little bit of time in the middle schools, I've yet to see an incident like that, um, but, I, I do really, I'd be curious to hear more about that and what the district can do. Thank you. Yeah. Director Shanta Gary. I, I just want to thank our school board uh, for this month being, you know, I don't have a committee report, but the fact that we're all working together in our leadership and so thank you very much. I'm just filled with so much gratitude. I mean, this journey has been tough, no doubt about it. I'm not here to say anything <coughs> different but the fact that we are all kind of together and uh, even though we may think we are approaching it differently, but we all have shared the same vision, same goals, same purpose, you know, that is beautiful. And so I really think, thank you to each other and thank you to Superintendent Perry, our board directors and all our leaders who are sitting here. And so that's one important thing. I, I wasn't here last month but a lot of community members really sent their thanks to the fact that our board approved that purchase of that aviation thing. You know, it is like, amazing how they really said thank you, thank you, because everybody has a vision of their children doing better than themselves and future. And they really connected the dots and said this is going to really jumpstart a big thing. So thank you, my fellow board directors, for 
voting in favor of it and giving hope to our community. That was, it is really needed, I'm telling you. So good job, thank you. Let's pat ourselves on our back. <laughs> thank you, Director Shandukeri. Director Avila. Um, uh, nothing to report on the recent past, but um, Happy New Year to everybody. And then, uh, but looking forward to celebrate uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day on this coming Monday. Uh, I'll be at the library with some community leaders there and looking forward to, to that event um, and for West Ham Juntos program to get kicked off as well. Well, um, all I really wanted to share, I mean, there was no SCATS policy meeting last month um, due to the holidays, but the only thing that I wanted to share is that we did have uh, the first like OSBA legislative policy committee meeting um, and we're gearing up and getting ready for the legislative uh, session that's starting after Martin Luther King Jr. Day, which it came up sooner than it normally did. Um, and so we're really gonna be working hard to make sure that we're able to get a budget that is able to fully fund all of our schools. That's, that's my dream and that's what I'm putting out into the universe. <laughs> That's awesome. Go I shared, br yes, thank you. I shared briefly about um, the social studies and English, or er, sorry, the English language arts. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, yep, yeah, yes, yep. so many acronyms. Um, meeting back in December and looking forward to having that next week. I will say it's really just fulfilling and encouraging to be surrounded by educators who are just so passionate about the work that they do and that, you know, just hearing like, this is how I can imagine, um, you know, this curriculum or this information being applied in my classroom and just being able to speak to how students might respond to it. So uh, I just wanna say that everyone, every opportunity I get to be around educators to me is always just super enlightening and appreciative for that. So thanks to um, all of our educators, you know, in the district and may you all, Hopefully everybody got a little bit of rest uh, and ready for this this 2023, which I have to say I'm really excited for. Um, my only goal is to read more, so. <laughs> yeah, I would like to just reinforce what's already been said, and that's regards to the board uh, working so collegiately and also recognizing that we have some outstanding teachers and staff already out there, and they're doing a great job, and whatever we visions we can provide or resources or guidance we'll do it so in addition to what um first <coughs> vice chair Inohos Pressy mentioned about the legislative policy committee for the oregon school boards association um which i was a part of i now just joined the board of osba so i've created a vacancy on the legislative policy committee so if any fellow directors wish to um, fill that vacancy and help us lobby the legislature this time around. We know we're going to need it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm also excited to be gearing up to do that work. When you're on the board of OSBA, you're also automatically on the Legislative Policy Committee. And so as the superintendent keeps mentioning, we are really going to be needing to push um, for every penny to make sure public education keeps moving forward. Um, I also had the opportunity to go to the winter concert at um, South Salem. Feels like it was forever ago, but I just want to give a huge shout out. Um, amazing music program combining the band, the orchestra, and various um, choirs to put on a phenomenal presentation. I just, every time I'm... Um, witnessing the arts in this district i am inspired i'm brought to tears it is so exciting to be like raising my children in a community that places such value on the arts um, as well as academics and everything else that's important so thank you um to the booster the parent booster group that invited me to come to that concert it was amazing and wonderful and last, a shout out to the McKay Culinary Program mm -hmm. um, for an excellent meal that they prepared for us tonight. We have um, two executive sessions, so we're gonna be here for a while and they made amazing food for us to sustain us throughout. Yeah, and uh, no shade to Sodexo, but that was a really good <laughs> dinner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Hey, and I wonder if I could make one more announcement. Yeah. I don't know if you know that Willie Richardson used to be on this school board. 
and uh, so uh, probably first and only African American on the school board and um, female at the same time. So opening up at Bush um, Art Gallery is Hattitude, the hats from the hat box of Willie Richardson. And there's just a long tradition of black women wearing stunning church hats to express a respect for God and their attitude reaches back generations. So that opens uh, this weekend at um, the Salem Arts Association and I'll send out the information. But yeah, just a, a really wonderful woman and I bet there are amazing collection of hats there. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll definitely go, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, anybody else? All right, not seeing any. Okay, so it is now 7.53 and the public portion of our board meeting has concluded. The board will now go into executive session under ORS 192.6602H to consult with counsel concerning the legal rights and duties of a public body with regard to current litigation or litigation likely to be filed. Representatives of the news media are allowed to attend executive sessions except for those sessions held in regard to expulsions. All other audience members are excluded from executive sessions. Representatives of the news media are specifically directed not to report on any of the deliberations during executive sessions, except to state the general subject of the session as listed on the agenda. No recording of executive sessions is allowed without express permission from the board. Um, there's no board business to be conducted following the executive session, and so that concludes the public meeting, our first meeting of 2023. Um, Happy New Year, everyone.